everyone to the Pockets of Knowledge podcast. I'm your host, Desiree Stanley. And with me today is my guest, Lily Pinedo Gangai. Welcome to the show, Lily. I'm so excited that you're here today. Thank you so much, Desiree, for the invitation. Really excited to be in community with you tonight. Thank you. I'm just going to say Lily is repping her school tonight. She is a program director at San Jose State, and that is one of the things that we're going to be talking about. And I love it. Uh, San Jose State, the historic value of that school in, in this community is just like nothing else. And, and we can certainly um, talk about that as well. But to start, I'd like to hear about what it is that you do at the university as a program director and in what department you're working. Sure. Thank you so much. So as you mentioned, yeah, San Jose State is the oldest in the California State University system. It's over 150 years old, started as as a teacher college, but it's still very much still has that reputation of, you know, being of service to the local San Jose community and now obviously beyond. And it's grown, obviously. And in the last few years, I started at San Jose State eight years ago. I came over from UC Santa Cruz. You still see my Santa Cruz uh, sweatshirt here. I was an alum of UC Santa Cruz. So I stayed working there shortly after I graduated, but then decided to come back to San Jose, uh, born and raised here in this area. Really wanted an opportunity to reconnect with the local community members and give back to, to students. And so I started at San Jose State actually as an academic advisor. In my role, I worked primarily with students who were undeclared, folks that didn't really have an idea what they wanted to major in, maybe were uncertain, too many pressures, maybe from family to go in a certain direction. And so really to help guide and navigate that decision-making for them. So in my role as an advisor, uh, not only did I do that for, for three years at San Jose State, there was also what's called the Chicanx Latinx Student Success Task Force and our African-American Black Student Success Task Force that had just been established at San Jose State. So I started right when that began and those initiatives uh, were really meant for community building. A lot of our Black and Latinx students on our campus didn't feel that there was a sense of community on our campus. Unfortunately, there had been some uh, situations where our students experienced Tate on the college campus. And as a result, the university, you know, and, and this is where I feel like the most universities sometimes wait to react to a, a situation like this to take action, but I'm glad that they did. And so the task forces were created to ensure that our students felt that there was a safe, welcoming and inclusive space on our campus that saw our students for who they were holistically and for students to be able to bring their whole selves to the campus without feeling fear or shame of who they were of the cultures and the backgrounds that were they were bringing with them to the university. So I was really excited that those task forces had just started when I transitioned over from Santa Cruz to San Jose State. Fast forward about three years later, the university understood that the initiatives and the activities that were being put forth by the task force were having a positive impact on our students' retention and their sense of belonging at the university. And we saw increase in graduation rates. As a result, they established permanent resource centers. I am one of the inaugural directors of one of those centers, which is the Chicanx Latinx Student Success Center. We just celebrated our milestone five years. Yay. Nice. Uh, In addition to our Black Leadership and Opportunity Center and our Undocu Spartan Resource Center. That's fantastic. I love it. And you made a good point that sometimes the universities are more reactive than proactive. They get there eventually, but sometimes not quick enough. Thankfully, you know, they have established these programs and they doing such great work and what you do, you know, helping the students really, this is such a huge part of their life, right? I mean, this is the transition from high school to college is such a leap and that they have this sense of community that you guys are building because of these programs is just just fantastic. I love it. So speaking about the program, um, what is it that you do specifically as a director of the program? Well, right now it's like, what do I not do is really really the question. (laughs) Um, Hence, um, I was telling Desiree, right, I'm coming in and just ran out of a meeting real quickly. I haven't had time to put on my face and do my hair, but sporting my gear. So with being the inaugural director, there's a lot of roles and responsibilities. Primarily is ensuring that we're serving our Latinx students on our campus. Just to give you some some context, we have 
probably close to 10,000 Latinx identified students, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Because of that, that demographic, it puts us at an eligibility to be a, what's called a Hispanic serving institution or a designated HSI, which is a, a word that you often hear out there, HSI institution. There are over 500 institutions across the United States. Some are emerging and then some are hoping to become HSI as they're seeing an increase in their in their Latinx demographics at their institution. So we became an HSI uh, designated institution back in 2014. But one thing that we ensure that we tell our campus faculty, students, and staff is that the HSI designation alone is not enough. So enrollment, it's based on enrollment. So we have the students, they're here, but what are we doing to ensure that we're retaining them, to ensure that they're feeling that they are a part of this, this community, and to ensure that we're helping them in achieving their academic, personal, and career aspirations beyond San Jose State. In my role as director, I have to come in with that mindset of not only are we focused on enrolling Latinx students, which is a great first step, but what are we doing once they're here, once they've arrived? How do we support them in their transition? And as you mentioned, that it's just so complex in terms of everything that they experience in mm -hmm. that transition from homesickness to financial barriers. And more recently, right, with the pandemic, it, that's even been layered. And there's some complexities on mental health and mental mm -hmm. wellness. The students that we're serving, you know, it's it's difficult for us because our infrastructure is so small. I'm a one, one full-time position in my center and I have a, a program coordinator. Uh, good news and bad news. So good news, my, my program coordinator has been with me, uh, was with me for four years. She just transitioned. Uh, she's now the inaugural program director for our Native Indigenous Center that is about to open up. So really excited professional development for her. But now I'm like, what am I going to do since I'm a two-person <laughs> team? Uh, but I was lucky enough to hire an interim position. That person actually was a student of mine that worked in our center while she was an undergrad and she just graduated this past fall. We really depend on on our student staff, which I have a team of about 16 students this, this semester. And we really rely on the support of the rest of the communities, so the campus community. So our professors, our faculty, and also our staff members across both the academic side and the student affairs side, which my, my office resides over the student affairs division, which is everything that has to do with outside of the classroom experience. So we develop programs and support services. Uh, so some of the programs that we develop are focused on, you know, the transition. So academic skills, what are the academic skill sets that students should have when they come to college? So academic skill-based workshops. Uh, and then we also have more informal opportunities for students to connect with professors and have mentorship opportunities. What is it like to have a mentor? What is a mentor and how can faculty and professors support you along the way? towards the end, their junior and senior year, when they're start starting to think about internship opportunities or career planning. We try to cover every part of the spectrum from when they enter as a frosh to graduation time and beyond. We want to make sure that they have something set in stone, whether it's an internship or a job or even graduate school. That's when it comes to programs and activities, that's what we do. But what makes our work so unique and difficult at the same time is that we really ground ourselves in the theory. So we're, we're mm -hmm. academics. <laughs> we really ensure that we're up to date with the scholarship that's out there, the research that's being done on how do we ensure that we're truly serving our Latinx students? What are they experiencing? Um, and how do we respond to that in a way that's going to address our students holistically? They're not just students. They're also right. maybe caretakers in their families. They're the breadwinners that have to take on multiple jobs. So when we view them from that lens, it allows us to pause and not make assumptions about why is a student not in class today? Or why has a student not been engaging in our programs? Because uh, we're quick to make assumptions. So mm -hmm. we're, we're really taking an asset-based approach and lens to how we view our students and how we work with our students. So I've been very fortunate to work alongside an amazing team of faculty members, uh, of staff members, and students. Really, the students are the ones who inform us on what we're doing right and where we have areas of growth. So we bring them along in that journey. So they walk with us. We invite them to walk this journey with us. And so the programs and the activities and the services that we offer are different every semester because we really depend on the pulse of the campus, like what's happening right now and how do we respond to those needs or how do we respond to those challenges or what's working and let's really amp those, those programs that are really working. So it's a lot that we do. And I, I pride myself in the work that we do because we're such a small team, but we've had 
had such a large and broad impact at the at the whole campus level. Wow, that's just phenomenal. I'm I'm just sitting here trying to take it all in because what you're doing is so fantastic. And I love that as you were talking about the the student who was the, your assistant co program coordinator is now taking on this new role, and you're bringing up students to you know fill in that spot. And it's just like this is how life works, right? We we have opportunities. You have those opportunities for advancement and you bring somebody up from the ranks, if you will, then the students see how this is all working, right? As part of regular life, they're getting the experiences that they can carry on into their next job, whatever it is that they're going to be doing, if it's not, you know, higher education. And it's just fantastic. I love it. And so I, I want to touch on something you've mentioned about the program being for Chicanx and Latinx community, and you yourself are first generation in higher education. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that's meant for you, you know, if there was challenges that you experienced and things that you had to overcome in the process, if you'd like to share that with us. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. I love talking about my journey to being an educator because it was not linear. That's the one thing that we like to highlight when we're talking to our students who are so stressed out about wanting to know exactly what they're going to be doing after they graduate, right? They, they think it's like, you have to have it down. Uh, when in fact, like I, I share my journey that really was by fate opportunities came my way. It was because of the hard work values that my parents instilled in me, which was make sure that whatever you're doing, you're always carrying yourself in a professional way, carry yourself in a way that is going to make you stand out and that people are going to want to say, I want to work with her. I want to bring her onto my team. My dad really was uh, one of my biggest role models growing up being such a hard worker within the, the local San Jose community. My father worked at Sacred Heart uh, Church here in San Jose. He worked there for over 30 years as a pastoral minister. And a lot of the work that he did was helping families and couples who were interested in baptizing their children or who wanted to go through first communions or who wanted to get married, help them with almost like marriage counseling courses. Uh, at a very young age, my dad used to bring me with him to work. And so mm. I would see how he would engage with families family members and with the local community. He also played the organ at church during Sunday mass. And I would always see how people at the end of church would gravitate towards him. They would want to say hello to him and shake his hand. And I was like, wow, my dad's famous. Um, <laughs> so I always held my dad on this pedestal. And so when it was my time to go to college, you know, my dad said, I want that to be your focus is to really focus on your education so that doors will open for you for a better future. That's why we immigrated to the United States. Both of my parents immigrated from Mexico in the, in the late 1970s. Many immigrant families, they wanted a better life for their, for their families and for their children. And so when I graduated from UC Santa Cruz, I had no idea what I wanted to do post undergrad as many of our current students are experiencing right now. But what I did know is that every job that I had, I took it seriously. And I always uh, told myself, how can I use this as an opportunity to challenge myself, grow, um, and learn from the people who are helping me grow. And so mm -hmm. I was very lucky to have been working at, right after I graduated from UC Santa Cruz to have worked as an intern at the, also called the Chicano Latino Resource Center at UC Santa Cruz. I, I was an intern there for my winter and spring semesters. But then after I graduated, the director invited me to apply to be the program coordinator for the position. In my eyes, I was like, what is she seeing in me that clearly Clearly, I don't see because I've only been here for two quarters and you're wanting me to apply for this position. So I freaked out and I'm like, uh, let me take a step back. Like, I don't know if I'm up for this challenge. My dad at that time some started experiencing some health issues. And he, I remember clearly he was at the hospital when I had received the invitation to apply for this job. And at the same time, I was working at Bath and Body Works at the mall at Eastridge. <laughs> <laughs> for those of folks who remember that, that I think it's still there. Being invited to become an assistant manager at the time at Bath and Body Works, that was what got me through college. And so in my eyes, I was like, that's a big deal to be invited to be, you know, apply to the assistant manager position. But now I'm having an invitation to be a program coordinator at an institute, at a university, at an institution of higher ed. So I was super confused about what to do. And my dad's like, 
honey, it's no brainer. He's like, it's at working at the mall or working at a university. I was like, you're right, dad. And so I went ahead and applied for the position and I got it. And that was my introduction to higher education. But for me, the biggest lesson learned was whenever you don't believe in yourself, somebody else has seen something in you that maybe you haven't noticed. So I've carried that lesson with me in every position that I've had in higher education, because I've just been tremendously blessed to have folks who see me and see my talent and see my knowledge and see what I bring to the table. And I've been offered jobs. So I've been very lucky that very few times I've had to go out and look for a job. I carry myself in a way that people are going to want me to work for them. Um, uh, shortly after I was the coordinator for El Centro at UC Santa Cruz, then I became EOP counselor. So EOP is the Educational Opportunity Programs Department, works primarily with students from marginalized backgrounds. So I got a, a chance to work with that. Uh, that program for about six years in a role as academic counselor. So we did academic advising, personal counseling all at once. And then at that point, I was like, I think I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. So I decided to go back to grad school. I got my master's in educational counseling at San Jose State. So I decided to leave UC Santa Cruz and make the leap back to my home community and started my program. And that's when I decided to also make the switch over to work as an academic advisor at San Jose State. Definitely my career was not linear. And as a first gen Latina, you know, it, it, it has had its complexities because I didn't have anybody in front of me showing me the way. I've had to figure it out on my own. But where my parents really supported me was just having the emotional support, which was really mm -hmm. key because there were times where I'm like, I, I can't do this anymore. It's really exhausting. And they would just reassure me in the background, right? They were like my cheerleaders in the back saying, you got this, it's going to be hard, but you got this. That's where then my, my professional mentors were the ones who were giving me the inside scoops. We call it the unspoken curriculum where people don't tell you what it takes to be successful in this field. And so you have to identify folks that have gone through it to then be able to bring you under their wings and support you in that way. So I have so many of, I call them academic uh, fairy godmothers and fairy godfathers who, who took yes. me under their wing, helped me unveil what uh, hidden curriculum was so that I could be successful in this field. And I will tell you there, I'm still figuring it out. It's not easy as I now think about, okay, what's my next step in my career trajectory? I still look to those mentors for, for advice and for support. Yeah. I love that you said that your parents were your biggest cheerleaders. We are so lucky for those of us who have had parents that are like that because not everyone does, you know, so it's like that support really is what helps us get through those tough times, right? As you said, it's not easy, you know, those late nights studying those exams and all of the stuff that's entailed in those programs, it's not easy. But if you've got the support, that takes a little bit of that weight off of you and you know you can keep going. And the point that you made about having mentors, again, that's those people who see something in you and help you bring that out. And then they also do help pave the way for you. I think that that's fantastic. And I think you are the mentor for those students who are in the program and you are showing them the way. And I love that so much. I think it's awesome. Yeah. The student that recently graduated that now is my program coordinator. There were so much alignment and similarities in our stories from being outreach to and recruited into their first professional job. So that was me. And now she's like, but now you're doing the same thing to me, right? Where you're reaching out to me. I, she was working at a local cafe and I'm mm -hmm. like, well, is it the cafe or is it, you know, working at the university, which is like, whoa, that happened to me. My dad's like, you're working at a mall versus working at the <laughs> university. We are about the same age. And so there was just a lot of alignment. I told her, I was like, I came full circle. She's just super appreciative of, of the opportunity. And that's what we do is we pay it forward for the next right. generation to come. And we, we help open those doors. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is ask you if there's anything that you can think of that specifically in the program that you've done, like an initiative that you guys have created that you're super proud of. I mean, the whole thing is just fantastic, but is there anything in particular that you want to point out that you've done that you're particularly proud of? Uh, there's two things. One, because I'm really in it right now. For my master's thesis statement or a thesis project, uh, I had proposed the development of a mentorship program that would 
would help support the transition of incoming Latinx frosh from high school to the university, but then would also have a second year component because we know that after the first year, the second year is where we see uh, an increase in attrition rates of our students who leave the university. So first year is the first, but then in the second year, we it's like the highest number of rates after the first year who drop out or stop out. And so my master's thesis project focused on developing a mentorship leadership program to help retain the students and help them stay at the university and, and graduate. Three years ago at the start of the pandemic is when I rolled out this program in real <laughs> life. And so we call, call it the Adelante program, Adelante meaning forward. It was actually the name. It was to honor the task force that I had mentioned earlier that was in existence prior to the establishment of our centers. So I wanted to honor the work of my colleagues and the students who uh, really poured their love and their heart into doing this work. And so I wanted that name to live on. So I named it Adelante, but it's a mentorship and leadership program for, for incoming Latinx students. We piloted it. I didn't know it was going to be the pandemic. So it piloted at the, the start of fall of 2020. And that's when we decided to shut down our campus fully and move to remote uh, instruction. So that was an extra challenge there, but I'm happy to report that this is the first year that we're fully back in person. So this is the third cohort of students that that have participated in our Adelante program. So we started with a small group of about 25 students, and we're now at a little over 50 students who, who are participating in the program. They get paired up with a peer mentor that they meet with on a weekly basis. They also receive holistic support from other uh departments on campus. So they get assigned an academic advisor that they meet with uh, twice a semester. They're also required to meet with a career counselor liaison to our center and then meet with our in-house faculty fellows that are part of the center. And then on top of that, we do require that they meet with a personal counselor. So we're like, mm -hmm. we're reaching you from all walks of life to ensure that all those aspects and elements of your life are being taken care of. So we, I'm proud to report, I just did my data not too long ago. Uh, we have at least the first two years, we were at 100% retention rates from the first year to the second year. This With the pandemic, we did see a little bit of a small decline in, in not student. So we dropped in students participating in the program, but they still remained at the university. For us, that's still a success. Right. So they, they may have shared with us that the reason they stopped participating in the program was because of work-life balance, right? So like I mentioned before, a lot of our students are having to work while go to school at the same time or have other family responsibilities. We were able to collect some of that data that said, you know, I love the program. I got the tools and the strategies and I know about the resources, but I have to step back this semester because I have these other responsibilities. So they're still at the university in that light. And that from that lens, we still have 100% uh, retention in the program, which is really great. For me, it's very near and dear to my heart because it's something that I proposed as a, as a master's thesis project, but to see it come to life has been amazing. The peer mentors that work with the mentees on a weekly basis, that's also professional development for them. So I tend to hire the students who were mentees the year prior, then apply to become mentors the following year. For me, that's the sophomore retention piece is they're coming back as sophomores, but they're coming back in a leadership capacity. And so they now feel empowered. They're like, I want to be able to give back to this program because they did so much for me and I want the next generation to receive that support as well. So they are invested. They are committed just to hear their story at the end of the semester, I require the mentors to share back, like, what did you learn? What did you gain as a result of this, this opportunity? And it always exceeds what my intentions, my goals are for the program. Uh, really proud of that. And we're going strong right now. Uh, we're in the second semester of this year, and we're just really excited to still be working. And for me to be able to work with now more mentors because I was able to secure an, an outside um, grant from a local community organization that was able to help us uh, secure more mentor positions so that we can increase the number of students who are participating in our programs. Really excited that we've been able to do that and hoping to see it grow in the years to come. I mean, talk about win, 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 even despite the pandemic and you know what happened there, you guys are just like killing it. And it was your idea and I love it. It's just fantastic. You're helping 
the students to fully succeed, right? I mean, you're you're not only giving them the tools, like you said, from every single direction possible to make sure that they have everything they need to be successful. It's just, wow, congratulations. That is something to be super proud of. And I'm sure you are. And the fact that these students are, you know, giving back to the the students that are coming up behind them, that's, I mean, it's a win. Again, a win, win, win. It just, everybody wins on that. And I love it. Uh, Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Lily. I do want to transition a little bit in our conversation because not only do you do this as the program director at San Jose State, you actually are also an entrepreneur and you have a photography business. And I want to talk a little bit about that because again, you know, first generation entrepreneur as well. You started this photography business and I and I want to hear like, was this something that you always did through your life? You just always loved photography or was it something you picked up later as a hobby and it grew into a, a business that you've created? So tell us about it. Sure. It's a little bit of both. I, I'm going to allude again to my father. He growing up was the one who always carried a video camera on him. So he wanted to document every single moment of our family's life. I mean, after school, coming home, having dinner, family trips, my dad carried that big old camera with him, right? We didn't we didn't have these phones. I remember as a kid, it was embarrassing. I'm like, why is my dad carrying this thing around and for every little occasion and, and going back and rewatching those videos, those home videos, it's like I was just such a young kid who didn't understand the importance of capturing these family moments, right? I was just annoyed by my dad. I'm like, dad, get out of my face. Like, I'm just eating a cupcake. Like, why are you here? In retrospect, I I can't thank my dad enough for having documented those moments in our in our family's life. It's it's part of our family history. I think that's what motivated me to become a historian. So I, I studied history as an undergrad and still very much so consider myself someone who likes to document stories. And in my case, it's through this media, right? Through through photography. There's a part of me that I feel that I sometimes don't remember much of my childhood. And so just from my own memory, there's a, a struggle with remembering some of my experiences. And that's where I go back. Sometimes I go to my parents' house and like, I need to pull out these tapes and I just need to remember like, what did we do that summer? So I now wanted to carry that family history and that So not only was it a a fun hobby, because I did start taking that up in high school. I just love taking pictures. But as I got older, I made that connection with what my dad used to do. And so I'm like, now I want to do the same for other families. I want to be able to document their story in this medium. Back in 2010 is when I did just start taking it a little bit more seriously. I purchased my first digital camera. And I remember back then it was five megapixels was like the coolest digital camera out there, the small little square digital camera. It wasn't a DSLR. It was one of those point and shoot. But for me, that was new, right? And it wasn't film. So I started taking pictures just for fun. I started getting better and better. I started just finding myself going online and reading a lot of articles. And I bought a lot of books on how to take better pictures and how to become a better photographer. I would like to say I'm self-taught. That's how I started for the first decade. And finally, I started asking family members, like, can I take pictures of your family? Then word of mouth started, right? So then that family would tell their extended family. And next thing you know, I have a portfolio uh, put together of different families that trusted me with taking their family photos, even though at the very beginning, I really didn't know what I was doing. Like looking back at my exposures, I'm like, Ugh, I cringe. But to see that development over the years and that commitment to become a better photographer, something that I'm very proud of. So finally, I would say we're in 2023. So I think it was around 2016, 2018, something around there. Uh, a friend just said, you know what? Why don't you consider starting this as a legit business? Of course, being in Silicon Valley, I'm like, you have to have two jobs if you want to stay living here. You know, my husband and I had just gotten married just a couple of years prior. 
and we were considering buying our first home and I'm like on an educator salary and, and Chris, my husband was in between jobs. And so I was like, you know what, maybe that's a strategic move. And so I started looking into it and to your point, first gen entrepreneur, I had no idea where to even start. Like, where do you look up business license and just every contracts and you have to hire lawyers to ensure all your contracts are legit and a business website and how are they going to pay you? It just, it was very overwhelming. And I go back to then networking and connecting with other people who've done it and reaching out and putting yourself out there. I went to LinkedIn and started just adding folks and connecting with photographers. Then I had a great opportunity after my husband and I got married that our wedding photographer agreed to have me as a second shooter. He specializes in wedding photography. I've done family photos, but let me try wedding photography, see how that is. So I reached out to him and he didn't hesitate. He's like, sure, come on board. And he allowed me to follow him. And I did my first wedding. I'm like, this is fun. And he, he liked my photos and like that increased my own self-confidence. I'm like, I think I can do this. So I took a leap of faith and just started. I met up with some other mentors and like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this a legit business. A couple of years ago I did. And so I had already my portfolio of clientele that I had you know, accumulated over the years, but I developed my website and I actually got prices down. And that's a whole different topic of like, how do you price yourself? Because you amateur, but I, not really. I'm in like an advanced amateur. <laughs> um, and so it took a while, but after doing weddings for a while, like, yeah, no, I don't think I want to do weddings. That's a lot of work for just one person. And I'm small and I'm petite and carrying all that gear. It was stressful. So I think I went back to my roots of why I asked myself, why do I love photography and why do I want to do this as a business? And for me, it was going back to what my dad did was to capture good old days in a, in a family's life, to be able to go back and remember good times in, in your life. And so that's where the name came from. So my photography business is called Good Old Days Photography. Really, it's my mission for my photography business is to help families capture and treasure moments in their lives, help freeze time because we know how quickly time goes. Yeah. So I've been doing it now for over a decade and, and still going wow. strong and love it. I love the story that you shared again about your dad with that giant camera. I can picture it. And I know like my father-in-law had a camera like that. I I've seen the videos, yeah. um, you know, we didn't have one of those giant cameras, but you know, as the, the technology started right. to change, you know, we did, we did get some of the smaller cameras. Those are precious, absolutely precious to be able to go back and see that footage, you know, of your family as you were growing up and the things that you did, the trips that you took, there's nothing like that. And I think that it's, it's brilliant what you're doing and helping other families to, you know, have those cherished memories that. But, um, they can look back on years later. And, and I love it. And the point that you made about the original photos that you were taking were maybe not so great, but <laughs> over time, your skills develop and they get better and better. And that's just like the story of life, right? Yeah. Is when we start something, we're, we're maybe not very good at it, but we continue to grow and develop and build our skills and we get better and better. And uh, I love it. Yeah, I even I have a family who I've been working with since those beginning days. It's amazing to see each year I now categorize their photos in an album from year one. And so it's not only fun to see how their children have grown over time, but to see my own work, right? And see how everything's developed and how the image is crisper. And I incorporated now using using right now off-camera flash is what people sometimes freak out about. Uh, mm -hmm. You see a lot of photographers uh, label themselves as natural light photographers, um, which some people really enjoy that look, but I wanted to challenge myself. I saw, as I mentioned, my friend mentor, uh, who I saw him with his off camera flash and I'm like, mm, okay, I want to give that a try. Cause that gives it a different look, very crisp and just it's beautiful. And so uh, that was the stark difference is not having any off camera flash to now incorporating that into my photos, which is what I love now the most mm -hmm. using that style. So that actually brings up a, a question I wanted to ask you, and that's what do you think truly makes a great photograph? And like, how do you, how would you say you could capture that? Sure. And I think that it's very subjective, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's going to depend on the style of the person behind the camera and then also the person receiving the photos. So your, your clients and what their vision is. 
uh, for their for their images. So every time I have a new client, I always have them complete an intake form. And I ask them, what's your vision for this photo session? Because I really want it to be unique to their family. You'll see a lot of photographers that have a very particular look and style. And then there's other photographers like, like myself that I call myself more of a lifestyle photographer, which I just, I'm going to go with the flow. I want to capture you in your, in the most natural way that your family is without making something look so posy, right? So unnatural. Right. Um, and especially it's, it's always interesting and, and fun. And I sometimes poke fun of, of some family members, but these are folks that I've already established rapport with. And so I know who to, who I can poke fun of and, or with, but usually it's, it's one in the family member that always feels awkward. And they're like, Oh, I don't want you to do this. Or I, let me hold your hand. Oh, I don't want to hold your hand. You're going to kiss me. No, that looks weird. <laughs> and so I make sure that when I meet with them and we have a consultation prior, I say, okay, what is an absolute, don't make me do this, right? Like, don't mm -hmm. make me hold my child's hand. And that's usually not the case, but, or children, like, I don't want to hold my sibling's hand. I don't want to kiss them. So that always helps. So the question of what make a great photograph, really it's, it's all of that. It's making sure that your unique style as a photographer is coming through and vice versa, that you're meeting the needs of your clients and what their vision is for their photographs. And so how do you come together to figure that out? I have had uh, clients who they'll see right now, everything. It's like you go on Pinterest or you go online and you're like, I want, like, this is what I want my family to look like. <laughs> <laughs> like this is the perfect, right? They say, this is the perfect image. Like everyone posts here on a tree hill somewhere and it's, it's raining in the background and my hair is, you know, the wind is blowing my hair and I'm like, that's going to be nearly impossible to replicate. So I have to put that on check sometimes and tell folks like, that's not going to happen. First and foremost, that's not your family. <laughs> And right. that's a different photographer. And so I, I have to have the hard conversation about, well, if that's what you're looking for, maybe we're not a good fit. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. you need to look for a different photographer whose style matches what you're expecting. And so most of the time I, I've gotten lucky. I haven't had too many folks that are like, okay, bye. Like, that's not <laughs> what I want. Most folks understand like, okay, you're right. Or sometimes I put them to the challenge. I'm like, okay, let's give that a try. Let's see how it goes. And so they show me the pose, we pose them. And afterwards, when I show them the image, they're like, yeah, that's not my favorite image of all the other ones. It tends to be the one where it's not as posed. I take most of my photographs outdoors. And so I might take a family to a park as I'm getting all of my gear together. The family's walking in front of me and I start capturing that moment from behind them because it's just so cute. Everybody's calm and relaxed. Sometimes those tend to be the, the favorite images of our of the families or the ones where they're not expecting me to be taking the picture. So I know that was a complicated answer to what seems like an easy question. It really does take all of those questions and factors when thinking about what makes the perfect photograph. And it's really unique to each to each photographer and to each client. Yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely right. It, it's not necessarily a simple answer. Um, the question is kind of complicated because there are so many moving parts, right? The people who are involved, the weather, <laughs> the cameras that you're using, you know, the photographer. And as you said, I, the intake that you get from the clients, right? The feedback that you're getting from the clients, all of that is important in making sure that you're, you know, getting what it is that they're looking for in a final product. I think that's, that's so fantastic because yeah, you could just say, okay, stand over here and I'll take this photo, but is that really what you want? And are you going to be happy with the result? And so that you take all of that feedback that they're giving you and that way you can give them what they really are going to be happy with. I mean, that's how you have to do it, right? Yeah. I want to make sure that families look back at their pictures that they can feel whatever emotions they were feeling in that moment. Even if it's 20 years later, I want to capture that as the essence of the picture is, do you remember being in that moment? And what were the emotions? What were the thoughts that were going through your mind when you were engaging with your family? If I can do that and the family tells me like I'm crying or I'm laughing, like that's a win for me. Um, yeah. which, which is not, it doesn't always happen. I I'm striving for that. That for me is a win when, when that could be delivered. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us, Lily. And I wanted to ask you if somebody was thinking like, I want to learn more about for photography, what are maybe some books or if there's a podcast or if there's any website that you could recommend that people could go check out and, you know, learn a little bit more if they would like to increase their skills in, in photography. Sure. 
Uh, so my go-to online, there's a website called SLR Lounge. And they have a lot of articles, free articles that they send out. You can subscribe to their newsletter and they send you a lot of articles to read that focus on the very basic foundational skills that you need to have to become a photographer to more advanced tools and strategies and professional development. So SLR Lounge. And then I would say the biggest for me is just the networking is mm. going online and adding people on LinkedIn, right? Filtering by photography in the Bay Area. I've joined a lot of, uh, actually quite a few professional uh, Facebook groups that focus on photography in, in the local Silicon Valley area. And oftentimes they're looking for second shooters or folks to cover a wedding. And that's how I've grown my network of photographer friends. And then you learn from them, right? We talked about the influence of mentorship. And then another piece is if you have the time, which a lot a lot of folks don't, but if you do, is taking a class or two at a at your local community college. So I was able to get my photography certification through De Anza Community College. So I took one class here and there every now and then until I was able to get fully certified. Um, so I didn't have I didn't earn my degree in art or photography, but I was able to get a certification that was also professional development for me. Um, and that you can do it. I think even now a lot a lot of the community colleges offer online courses mm -hmm. that you could mm -hmm. just take the classes from the comfort of your own home. Uh, so I would say SLR lounge linked LinkedIn. Um, and then of course the, uh, the professional or going to community college and being able to take some courses online. Oh, fantastic. Great recommendations. And, you know, uh, you mentioned Deanza and I was speaking with a guest previously. We were talking about community college and, um, you know, she worked at Gavilan for, probably 20 plus years and just the, they're like the, the heart and soul, like workhorses of, you know, the, the community that helps so many people in the community mm -hmm. who maybe can't go straight into a four-year uh, university or, or, or college. They're just fantastic. And so like taking these sort of courses that you can get certifications in, building up to get your AA, you know, transferring into a four-year school to finish your degree. They're the unsung heroes is, is how she put it. And I think it's true. I love it. And there's never a right time to go back to school. So I hands down to folks who make the decision to go back to school at a later, later point in their life. Um, I'm seeing that right now. And, and it's major kudos to them because I know it's it's added added challenges, but when they they get it done, it's such a proud moment. And so, mm -hmm. uh, so yes, definitely consider the community college route. Well, to wrap up our conversation, if people do have questions uh, that they'd like to ask you about photography or the services that you provide, how would people get a hold of you? Sure. So I am on LinkedIn. So you can find me through my profile. I don't know if we'll be able to include some links here uh, in yes. the YouTube channel afterwards. I'm on LinkedIn or folks can email me as well. Um, I have both my good old days photography email account. Uh, if folks are interested more so in the pathway to being an educator, they can email me at my San Jose State email. Um, let's connect that way via that social media platform. I'm also on Instagram. Uh, if you want to see some of my photography work, I have my good old days photography Instagram page that I like to keep active. Um, so you can check me out there too. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll be sure to include all that information in the show notes. So listeners can find that information there. And thank you again, Lily, for taking the time to share all of the great work that you're doing in so many different areas. I love it. I mean, you're making such a difference in so many people's lives in such unique ways. I love it. So thank you again, Lily. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share, right? This, uh, this information and a little, little part of, of my, my crazy life. <laughs> um, but that I absolutely love. And um, I hope that if anybody's interested in learning more, um, that you reach out, don't hesitate. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. 